Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third Wednesday program. My name is Miranda Chirac, and I am the educator here at Rome Historical Society. Uh, thank you for tuning into our virtual program. Rome Historical Society offers free programming on the third Wednesday of every month. So we're happy for you to be here with us today. Um, right now, we're in the process of transitioning back to in-person programming. So keep an eye on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Rome Historical, and our website, romehistoricalsociety.org, for the most up-to-date information on that transition. Um, another update is that the society is open to the public, so you can find our hours of operation online. Um, and I want to give a shout out to our corporate members, Mohawk Valley Community College, AIS, and Revere Copper. We appreciate all the support from all of our members. And if you want to become a member, you can visit our website or you can come in and ask us directly now because we're open, which is exciting. <laughs> so without further ado, getting to our program today, we have Greeley Ford with us to talk about cellular mobile networks. Um, and Greeley, you're a man who wears many hats. Um, <laughs> so currently you're the commissioner for the New York State Liquor Authority. Um, you also work for AT&T as a mobile network engineer and communications manager. Um, and in the past, you've worked for the office of the New York State Senator. And you're also a member of the local band Classified. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of, you do a lot of things, uh, but today we're going to talk about your experience in the early 90s as one of the original eight employees of Cellular One uh, in the central New York region. So correct me if I'm wrong, but Cellular One was one of the pioneer um, cellular networks. Is that correct? Uh, back in the early, early days, uh, the FCC licensed cellular networks it was a duopoly. Uh, they provided for two licenses in each market. And uh, in my deck, I'm going to show you what I mean by markets. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So uh, one, one of the licenses was given to, uh, was awarded to uh, one of the local landline telephone companies, you know, around here at the time that would have been, say, Frontier, might have been uh, Northland Communications, 9X back in those days, whatever. So they were all in one bucket. And then there were all the entrepreneurs, all the other uh, partners and companies that might have wanted to get into the business, such as Gaffney Communications, such as uh, Midstate Communications, uh, JPJ Electronics, uh, all those. So they weren't affiliated with the local landline, so uh, they could apply for a license on the other side. So uh, the non-affiliated with the li landline, those are called a Class A license, and the ones that were... Uh, affiliate with a, a landline company, those were called a B license. So you had an A and a B awarded to each market. So, uh, and this, but so the one was actually really a, a brand name. So you had, if you had like 9X, for instance, you could say 9X Mobile or Frontier Mobile or Utica Rome Cellular back in those days. So uh, that was one thing. So these were all established names. So Cellular One became uh, a conglomerate name where all of these different A class licensees across the country, later B licenses got on it too, but that's a whole nother story that we don't have time for today. But initially all the A licenses got together and it says, we're gonna call ourselves Cellular One so we look like a national network. But back in those days you had roaming, you know, when you left your area, uh, you had to know uh, if someone wanted to call you, they'd have to dial a, uh, uh, another number, access number to the other network, and then call your number to get you. Uh, fees were exorbitant. You paid a per day charge. Uh, it was a big hassle trying to reach somebody when they're outside of their home network. Boy, has that all changed, right? So now we just pick up the phone and we dial anywhere. We expect a call to work anywhere. We expect to be able to make a call, or receive a call anywhere. That's how things have changed over time. So uh, cellular One, uh, our first, uh, we were the first uh, license in, in central New York, and uh, it was a Syracuse market first, and then later on, the next round came the Utica Rome license. So the original round of licenses, the FCC uh, looked at uh, evaluations. They, they evaluated applications by, uh, uh, by completion, 
uh, by ability to actually get a network off the ground. They were all individually evaluated and subjectively selected who got it. But that became kind of overwhelming pretty quickly. So what they did was they changed things to a lottery. And so you put your package in and they literally, you know, pull out an A license and a B license for each market and go, there you go. You have, I think, five years or something like that to get the market up and running. And if you didn't, then you would lose the license. If you don't have all the license covered that the license requires you to have covered, then that portion of the area can get re-auctioned off. So you could lose Spectrum that just pay, you paid a lot of money for. So, And then uh, Telecom Act came in 1996. And then there's a whole bunch of other Spectrum that got auctioned off, PCS Spectrum. And that's how you know Sprint uh, came to be. That's how uh, T-Mobile came to be, which used to be Vodafone. Uh, it was something else before that I can't remember, but that's when it kind of exploded with other uh, other carriers getting into the business. Uh, the FCC uh, allocated other spectrum towards uh, towards cellular. Originally, the original spectrum was in the 800 megahertz range, which is where channels. Uh, remember uh, TV? You're probably too young, Miranda, but those us old timers remember television sets that went like channels two through thirteen. And then UHF, 14 through, I think, 83. So uh, the cellular channels were the, uh, uh, the, the ch channels that were allocated towards cellular were the upper parts of that, uh, that UHS, UHF spectrum. So that's why old TVs, you could pick up a, a cellular call if you had the right channel. You know, old scanners, yeah. you could pick it up because it was analog. That changed with the advent of digital. So um, that's kind of how it make a, a short answer really long. Right. <laughs> okay. So, right, that's so now, how it started. Um, with your presentation, you're going to tell us a little bit about how these cellular networks work yep. and the evolution of them through time. Now we're more in the digital era. Um, Completely. Completely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. We've already, you know, AT&T has already retired 2G a long time ago. Uh, 3G is going to be shut down in, in February of this year. And uh, I'm, I'm, I can't speak for other carriers, of course. Let me just say that officially. But from what I've read, uh, the other carriers plan on shutting down their 3G probably by the end of next year as well, or shortly thereafter. We need that spectrum for LTE and for 5G and 6G and all that kind of stuff that we're going to talk about. All right. All right, so I'm going to start your presentation, and I'll I'll hand it over to you right. to, to take it away. Okay. Uh, All right. You see that? All right. Yes, I can. Yes. <clears throat> so, what you see there is a a map of my area of responsibility for AT and T, upstate New York, and uh, those northern counties of Pennsylvania. So, my organization is tasked with the uh, the growth operation, management, spectrum allocation, deployment, construction, uh, troubleshooting, uh, performance, optimization, anything and everything to do with the wireless network, the mobi mobility network in this territory, uh, my group is responsible for. So uh, pretty much the whole state. Uh, and it's all done this way primarily because that's the way the network elements all work. So all the network elements, uh, we're an Ericsson network. So uh, all of our switches and everything uh, control this market. That's why we have Northern Pennsylvania, because when we inherited it, uh, it, was, it was all on the same network. So that's why we kept it. It just didn't make sense to give it to our Pennsylvania allies when uh, the system wasn't run uh, out of their switches. Uh, feel free to, to interject and ask any questions, Miranda, if you want to, uh, you know, for anybody listening, if you say, hey, you left something out there, guy. So <laughs> go ahead to the next slide from there. Gotcha. So five fundamental components of a wireless network, the wireless device, obviously, cell site, the radio spectrum, backhaul transmission facilities, which can either be, it used to be T1s or copper, um, but now uh, just about, well, everything is fiber. We can't have copper in our network, too slow, uh, not enough capacity. So everything's fiber. Uh, we do have microwave uh, that we use to uh, bring some sites home. In other words, every cell site is wireless to the point of, to the phone, to the, to, to the uh, cell site, be it a tower or whatever. Um, but from that point on, it's typically wired. 
fiber, otherwise, uh, back to the main server or the switch, whatever uh, may be. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it requires, uh, in, in some places like up in the Adirondacks, which are kind of difficult sometimes, a portion of that backhaul may actually be on microwave. We do have you know, a lot of sites that still are on microwave transmission from point to point uh, before they finally get the fiber, just because it's just no way to get fiber to the top of some mountains. It's just the way it is. And then uh, ultimately, uh, uh, the wireless switch or the server in the case of LTE. Uh, we, wireless switches or MITSO, mobile telephone switching offices, those are kind of old school and gone by the wayside for the most part. Um, everything right now is voice over IP. It's all server based. So uh, it's not quite the same as it used to be. But for the purpose of this discussion, we'll just still call it a switch. It's got to go someplace for the call to be processed or the session to be processed and sent from wherever else it's going, be it uh, to another subscriber on another network, on our network, on our internet, whatever. It's pretty complicated. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. These are the original MSA and RSA FCC licensing uh, uh, districts. So it's all by county. So MSA is metropolitan statistical areas and uh, RSA are rural service areas. That's not anything unique to cellular, uh, but that's the, the protocol that the FCC used. So you can see uh, yeah, Utica was uh, Herkimer and Oneida County. Uh, you can see the other markets pretty much easy to figure out. Like Buffalo was uh, Niagara and uh, Erie County. Uh, Rochester, what, Wayne, Monroe, uh, Orleans, Genesee, Livingston, and Ontario counties, I do believe, yeah. So you can see how that was. So the, the original licenses were licensed to the blue areas. And that was in 19, that was through maybe 1990, something like that. And around 1991 or so, uh, I might not be exactly right about that, but about that time, early 90s, that was when they licensed out the rural service areas. And, uh, you know, that's how we, we got Watertown. And, you know, we didn't win Watertown, at t didn't. So we had to work out agreements uh, with the person that did run it so that we could maybe run it off of our switch and make his life easier. That was our sales pitch to him anyway. On so, this map, what are the green areas signify? They're just not covered or don't have license? The green areas were the ones that came in later. They are rural service areas. So the blue are the metropolitan and the MSAs, the ones that got licensed first across the country. And then in the next round came the rural service areas, which are the green areas, which came later, a couple of years later. So that the, the effort to begin with was to get cellular service launched in these blue areas first. In other words, if you look at them, what are those blue areas? They're pop centers. That's where the population was. So that's why they're metropolitan statistical areas and the ones that had to be uh, addressed first. And then the rural areas got you know, addressed next. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, this shows you just an AT&T uh, mishmash of uh, what we were like back in 2005. And this is all 2G coverage back then. So back then, you know, we were uh, singular wireless, which was all orange. That was our coverage. Um, we bought Dobson, which is green, and uh, uh, AT and T. Uh, we eventually bought them too. At that time, we were it was AT and T Wireless, not AT and T Mobility that we are today. So you can see where they were covered. Uh, uh, Endless and Endigo down in uh, Pennsylvania, and up in uh, the northeast corner of the state, RCC rural rural cellular, which pretty much had most of their licenses were in Vermont. Uh, New England, and they owned that top corner of New York State. So that was all what we what we had to work with, uh, and what we bought and uh, eventually acquired to become one network, which I'll show you on the next slide if you want to go to it. So this is what we look like today, all one big happy family. And uh, what you're seeing basically is the uh, the orange is LTE uh, service, and the uh, the blue is pretty much 5G. Uh, 850 band service across the, the state and New York City. So you can see we've come a long way, filled in a lot of the blanks. Yeah. So um, 
the white areas on this map, is it safe to say those are the highest elevations? Those are areas where that's, that's pretty much like most of them are in the Adirondack Park. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, it's very coverage challenged. You know, it, it takes years to build a single cell site in the Adirondack Park. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the past two years, I think we've turned up like nine new sites in the Adirondack Park, which is just light speed. So we have uh, several others under construction and hope to bring them up online within the next year or two. They, they just take, they're, they're very difficult with uh, zoning, a uh, lot of uh, resistance to building sites. Uh, the communities up there, many of the community want the sites to be unseen. They don't want them on peaks. And unfortunately, if they can't be on a peak, they're not going to be very effective. So we have to find mutually agreed upon solutions. And uh, it just takes a while to get everybody on board. And even then after everybody, after everything is done, <laughs> everyone still isn't on board, but you know, we all do the best we can, but we're working on it. All right. So the road from 1G to 5G, uh, we have 1G back there. You can see the brick phone, 2G, the, uh next generation where you can get start to get text and things 3g you can do some internet cruising not very fast but you could 4g phone calls text video and then 5g is uh next holy grail you know phone calls text you know ultra hd 3d videos internet all that kind of stuff so it's all a logical progression over the years go to the next slide so this is just showing you the differences like uh, 1G uh, was analog, basically. Uh, the original platform for the original cellular networks, uh, like I said, uh, 850 UHF TV, where it used to be, talk to one cell site at a time. 2G uh, carriers went in different directions. Uh, uh, the landline side, the B carriers, mostly went with the root call CDMA, code division multiple access, and uh, the rest of us went with TDMA or GSM, uh, another type of platform. Uh, a digital platform. Um, 3G GSM, uh, that became a, a stepped up version. Uh, that became, actually, that was like really 2.5, we can call it 3G, but it really was uh, uh, making things a lot more available to be used on uh, uh, mobile networks, internet, things like that. Like the first iPhone, which in 2007, which was exclusively on, exclusively on AT&T was, was 2G only. And then they finally came out with a 3G version. So uh, that was really making it so that you can do a lot more with it. Although, you know, Spectrum was a little bit limited. We all had a, a, a lot of growing to do un until that all worked out. Uh, next slide. And then you get to 4G or LTE for long-term evolution, which I remember reading about back in the late 90s. So what's happened is, We've had all these different types of technologies, and here we are in 2021, where every carrier is using the same technology. So you can use the same phone on anybody's network now, assuming they have the, the radios have the uh, spectrum, proper spectrum built into the phone. But for the most part, you can take your phone, not just your, with your phone number, but you can take your phone and go between carriers. You don't need to buy a new phone anymore in most cases. So... If you'd asked me if you could do that uh, 30 years ago when I started, I, I would have said it never would have happened. But, you know, here we are. And it's a great thing for, uh, for consumers and users because it means that everybody uh, is on the same platforms. It means that you can roam on one another a lot easier. And, you know, it's a probably pretty well-kept secret, but we roam on each other a lot where we have to. We're not all uh, enemies in every, in every sense of the word all the time. Sometimes we do what's best. <laughs> what a concept. Right. <laughs> uh, so, and 5G is really just a stepped up version of, of LTE, 4G. Uh, but LTE is, is the grand poobah. It's the holy grail for everything going forward. So uh, a lot of what's going on with 5G is uh, we'll put network elements, uh, say, uh, at the cell site level. So for instance, if you needed to do something on the phone, a certain type of session, you don't have to go all the way back to the server and the switch and through the internet to wherever you got to go to get it. It's just at the, at the cell site level. So you, you get it, get what you need and you go back. So no latency, instant ping, all that kind of stuff. Uh, 
Uh, and 6G, 6G is talked about now, which we don't really think is going to be out before 2030. Um, and it's going to do things like be able to, you know, charge your phone over the air, uh, which is really cool. So just like power, POE, power over Ethernet, devices will be charged with signal over the air. So it's pretty cool. That's what they're talking about doing wow. with 6G. And then like incredibly fast multi-gigabyte speeds. So that's where we're headed. With wow. driving self-driving cars and things like that, that really becomes a lot more of an issue. Uh, but it's going to be a while till you see uh, 6G everywhere or anywhere. Next slide. So in a nutshell, there's your device over there. It communicates wireless to a set wirelessly to a cell site, which goes down coax or fiber, whatever, down to the equipment shelter, over to the public telephone switch, net, switch network. Next slide. And cell sites, you know, there's plenty of examples of them. There's traditional monopoles, uh, things that we call monopines, the monstrosities that they are, but sometimes we're forced to build them uh, because they don't fool anybody. And it kind of looks stupid to me, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, flagpoles, water tanks, uh, and there's another uh, tree uh, inside church steeples, uh, cactus, um, uh, steeples, roof chimneys. That was actually one of my projects. It's in Fayetteville above a laundromat. They look like chimneys, but there's really antennas inside. Or silos uh, that are really antenna towers built inside of a silo that's made out of fiberglass for aesthetics, of course. Next slide. Uh, cell site. Any location that houses antennas and radio equipment, usually a tower monopole, like I said, tower structure, whatever supports the antennas and the cell sites communicate uh, via two-way uh, radio signals spectrum between the wireless device to the uh, triangle, triangular uh, antenna arrays on the tower, which in turn are connected to the radio equipment, which is now uh, with LTE, the radios are at the uh, top of the tower behind the antennas and it's fiber from that point home. So it's not like the old days where the radios were down in the shelter. Uh, you lose a lot. So by putting the radios right behind the antennas, uh, they're immediately converted and on your way. A lot less lag time. Next slide. It's an example of a shelter of uh, antennas going into a shelter, coax. Next slide. Different types of configurations at cell sites. Next slide. Wireless switch, that's kind of old fashioned. Don't have really have them like that very much more, but you get the idea. Next slide. Uh, wireless device, obviously. This is a little, this slide is a little bit old, but it's from an old deck <laughs> that I pulled it from, but you get the idea. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Different devices, computers, uh, sticks, phones. Uh, every, every phone just about nowadays is, uh, nowadays is, uh, uh, some type of data device. That's where we're at. You don't see too many phones that are just calls only. Next slide. Uh, radio spectrum provides the wireless link. Uh, various frequencies, I'm going right to the bottom uh, bullet point, providing wireless service, 600, 700, 850, 1800, 1900, 2100, 23 megahertz, 39 gigahertz millimeter wave. Uh, millimeter wave is where uh, 5G is going in, in suburban, urban areas. Uh, you probably won't see it too much in urban areas, uh, uh, suburban areas from anytime soon because it doesn't go very far. It's what everybody has concerns about, and it's kind of it's kind of unfounded uh, because the signals are so weak in 39 gigahertz millimeter wave. They don't penetrate anything. They don't even go through windows, so they don't go. They have to be on, on poles or something like that every couple hundred feet apart because they're so weak. So, but they are super wide band frequencies. So they provide like really tremendous amount of capacity where they are deployed. Uh, so you'll see more of that as time goes on. But uh, 5G is not just there. You know, all the 5G I showed you on that map of AT&T, uh, the second or third slide, uh, all that blue area, that's 5G NR. Uh, in other words, it's in the 800, 850 megahertz range, the original cellular frequency range. That, that's where yeah. a massive amount of 5G is deployed as far as most of the country. Next slide. Uh, when a wireless device is turned on, it registers. 
uh, that enables the network to deliver a voice calls or data request. Nowadays, the phone, the network knows where you are all the time. It used to be that whenever a request came to make a call, to receive a call, the network would ping the entire, the switch would ping the entire network looking for you. But it doesn't do that anymore. That's a tremendous waste of resources. So now every, every device on the network, the switch, servers, they know where you are. So if something comes in, bam, gotcha. All right. I have a question about I have a question about this in um, a yes. more populated area where there's a lot more devices do you yeah. need more infrastructure to keep it efficient or is that not a variable Yes we need uh, the more customers there are in the area the more cell sites we need or small cells we call them or uh, more capacity more spectrum more everything you know mm -hmm. that's the beauty of of cellular is that you can split and divide, split and divide, split and divide to a certain point. And so that's why, you know, you'll have like cell sites uh, uh, right on top of one another uh, in cities that in, in urban areas uh, and uh, uh, more uh, country areas, suburban areas, I keep getting too mixed up. In suburban areas, you'll have one site covering, you know, several square miles. Uh, in a city, you don't want a site that covers several square miles. You want it to cover, you know, a, a specific area, be that whatever it may be. But mm -hmm. it's not, we call those sites that cover everything. We call those pollution sites. And we don't build them anymore just because you can't reuse a spectrum when it's being spewed all over the place. Right. Now, there's a trade-off for that, like up in the Adirondacks. If that's what we have to do, that's what we have to do. You know, you're trying to get the most bang for the buck. So every site has to be designed for what it's being purposed for. All right. you know, go to the next slide. Uh, I think I might have talked about this already. When you hit the send key, the device sends a radio signal to the nearest cell sites, antennas, where the signal is delivered to the radio equipment, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. uh, switch processes the information is sent by the wireless device, validates the customer's telephone number and other info, such as, is the bill paid and can we let this go through? Very important. And uh, <laughs> then enables a connection. So that's how that all works. It's all done instantaneously. Uh, and you hand off from cell site to cell site. So when you're traveling by car, train, or on a call, whatever, the wireless network and the device constantly monitor the quality of the call. And uh, so uh, this is my little uh, depiction of a cellular network. So as you drive around, you're going from one cell site to the next. Sometimes you might be on a couple for a split second while you're being handed off. So the network is all, and the phone are always talking to one another to determine which cell site should you be on, which one is going to give you the best call quality, the best connection quality for data, uh, which one has room for you. Uh, and it's not always the closest one to you. Uh, there's reasons why a site could be the closest one to you. It could be kind of busy right now. So the network makes, uh, you know, snap judgment decisions, you know, in, in the millisecond time frame where to put you or where to camp you. So that's just part of the process of how calls are, are handled right. to keep the call alive. Next slide. Data sessions, uh, same thing pretty much. Uh, this slide is a little bit outdated as I'm looking at it because with LTE, everything is data. Voice is data. Data is data. Everything is data. It all goes through the same servers. So it's just looked at differently on the tail end. So. Right. So I think that's pretty much the last slide. Is that it? I think yes. it is. That was. Yes, yeah. that was it. Wonderful. So I, I probably raised more questions than I've answered, but such is the nature of, of these things. I think it speaks to how complex it is. And it's, you know, it's something that, um, I'm going to stop sharing. It's something that I use every day and quite honestly, probably take for granted. So. Uh, it's yeah, nice to we hear all, from someone like you. And yeah, we all do. You know how you want to hear from people in your house uh, that you haven't seen in a while? Shut down the Wi-Fi and people come out from all over the place. What's going on? You know, it's a, it's kind of funny how we communicate. You know, in the same house, we'll text each other. One's, my wife's upstairs, I'm downstairs or something like that. You know, dinner's ready or whatever. You know, you, you could just yell, but, you know, we text now. That's just the way we are. It's yeah. cool. I love it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, um... Just for the last few minutes, I have something from our collection that I wanted maybe you to, to tell us about. This is okay. a car phone. Um, and what you would do is you would bring it with you and there's a, you know, a talking device in here. 
It's an old bag phone. Actually, we call that a bag phone or a transportable. Those components that you just showed me, uh, those are really for a mobile install. Remember those? You used to install phones in the car. So that's right. really all it is, a tra transceiver. And that would go like in the trunk or something like that. And then uh, the industry had the uh, brilliant idea to make them transportable, put them in a the bag, just you know, take the harness, all the wiring, and put it in a bag, put a little rubber ducky on it. Right. And so that became a, a th yeah a third type of phone. Yep. So you had that, you had the transportable, you had the uh, mobile and you had the, the portable, the old brick phones. Right. And uh, so that was a three watt phone. The mobiles were three watt phones. Uh, the uh, portables are typically half a watt, six tenths of a watt. They're not very powerful at all uh, meant to be because uh, you know, you're holding them close to your head for one thing and uh, for safety reasons mm -hmm. uh, and for other reasons that uh, they just couldn't support uh, the radios and the power that would be needed for a, a, a three watt device. Yeah. I just think it's interesting to hold this and know that, you mm -hmm. know, my cell phone can do even more than what this big thing could do shows the evolution of it. Not even a comparison. Yeah. It's like, you know, your, your iPhone has more, uh, computer technology savvy in it. I've heard something like that than like, you know, the computers that sent men to the moon, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So it just shows you how, how things have advanced. It's all about microchips. I think it's interesting how you said, um, I don't remember what it was, but 30 years ago, you would say, oh, that's not possible. And now here we are. So it's, it's exciting to see what's going to be to come in the next 30 years. Yeah, you know? sure is. I won't be around here. I'm out of here shortly, but, uh, you know, I can't, I can't wait to see how it all works. I've been, I've been here 30, 33 years. So, uh, I think, uh, as Shaq says in the commercial, that's enough. So I'm out of here. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time to go through it with us, uh, because you were really there for that whole, that whole time that we, you know, brought us yeah. to where we are today. So. And I cut really my teeth here in, in the Utica Rome market. You know, uh, yes. I started out in sales. I wanted to get in engineering, but the only way I could get in the company was to, to enter through sales. So I did that for a couple of years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they, uh, they had uh, a few key salespeople come to work with network engineering to uh, help expand the network. Uh, so I went out and hit the pavement uh, doing the site acquisition, zoning, leasing, construction of cell sites. I didn't know anything about it at all. They just said, really, you're a smart guy. You'll figure it out. And uh, so that's all my training has been uh, taught by doing the job. Uh, so uh, it's been a great experience. It's been the ride of a lifetime. And I can't believe I was lucky enough to find a career doing something that I love. It's so, a dream. And one other thing, classified is not together anymore. So that's not in the picture anymore. Something oh. had, my wife says, really, something's got to give, something's got to go. So um, I ended uh, back in February of 2020, just before the, the uh. pandemic hit full swing. So um, it was a planned exit that we didn't even know how well-timed it would be, but it worked out just perfect. So glad to see a lot of my buddies are, are, are playing again and the music scene is coming back again. It's great. I love it. Now I can go out as a civilian. Yeah, <laughs> go enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, all thank good. you very much. And um, I want to say thank you to all our viewers who watch this program. I hope you found it interesting and engaging. And I hope you see you on our next virtual program. Thank you, everyone. Bye.